it. All right, let's let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you give us hope in a world that uh, uh, that needs, desperately needs hope. Uh, you give us life. Uh, we know that this life uh, is on this this life is temporary. It has difficulties. We look forward to an eternal life with not just no difficulties, but full of glories. And Jesus came to make that possible for us, came to reveal it to us. Help us uh, today as we study more about what Jesus did and what he taught, how he acted, how we can respond to him. We ask your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, we were in uh, Mark chapter 1 and roughly uh, verses 17 or so we were talking about how the calling of the disciples and I, I ran across something in my reading this week that I thought I'd go back and look at a, a little bit again uh, here let's oh yeah let's share the screen and we were here, like verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, where they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And I commented there that uh, this was not necessarily a permanent thing. They just didn't leave. Uh, it could have just been for one day that they did that. And uh, so I, I saw there in Luke 5, verses 1 to 11, a, uh, a, a similar thing, uh, also a calling. And so I wanted to go look at Luke 5. Uh, okay, share, share this screen. And this, in Luke 5, the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God. He was standing beside the lake of uh, Gal Gennesaret, Galilee. And he gets into the boat and he's teaching. Uh, he tells Peter to put in your net for a big catch. And, and they get a huge catch. And Peter realizes that, whoa, this is uh, amazing. Uh, Jesus must be a holy man, but I'm unholy. So he, he kind of they were, you know, you go away. I'm, I'm a sinful man, he says in verse 8. And then down, in, uh, they were in the boats. And verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. In Mark, they are standing on the shore. In Luke, they are in boats. And so the one obvious, either this is too... Uh, one account is not quite right of the other, or it's two different uh, events. At, at more than one occasion, the disciples left all and followed Jesus. Uh, because Jesus wasn't telling him 24-7, he just says, you know, come today. Uh, I will make you learn, you know, I'll help you catch people. Uh, I will, you know, I'll teach you something. So they went with him, and they continued to. It, it, it was kind of formalizing a discipleship relationship that had been there before uh, when the, uh, Peter, you know, Simon and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist. And John pointed them to Jesus as kind of, uh, as a greater one. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a better teacher. You, you know, this, this is the one you should follow. So when Jesus called them, uh, um, but, you know, on more than one occasion, then they were ready to respond to him and ready to be taught. Uh, I also had a, uh, a little a picture of uh, a, a fishing nets. Oh, and now my Zoom menu is covering up. My, uh, okay, there. There we go. Uh, this is a uh, stock photo of a man with a fishing net, the kind of thing to throw from shore. Uh, you know, in this case, he's weighted in. Uh, but the fish, the net has little weights all around it, and they, they throw it in an arc, and it drops, and they pull in some 
uh, some, hopefully, some fish. They don't, as I think anybody that goes fishing knows, you don't always catch fish. Well, now, Jerry was just telling me how he caught 400 some. Maybe he always catches fish. But I, I hear a lot of stories of people going fishing and they don't catch anything. And that happened to Peter sometimes too. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the way it would work. Others were in, and there is, I, I've got a picture of uh, there. This is the boat they found in the uh, first century boat, or remains of it, found in the Sea of Galilee, uh, up in the northwest part of it, as I recall. Uh, it was, you know, the top part is rotted out, but overall the, the bottom part was covered with mud and that helped prevent it from rotting. When the sea, when there was a drought in uh, Israel, the Sea of Galilee water level dropped and then they found this, found this boat there. And it was very fragile. Uh, I'm not sure that Barb uh, has been to Israel and she may have seen this on display in the museum. Uh, but this is, it's, it's a pretty simple boat, uh, really. In fact, <laughs> the write up on this one said, from Wikipedia, which I don't know, is a usually a reliable source, says there are 10 different kinds of wood in this boat. And there's a, it's either there was a shortage or uh, I, it's the theory that I thought sounded more plausible is that they kept patching it. Uh, they would you know, something would go wrong and then they would fix it with whatever wood they had uh, around at the time. This is from the first century as they could date it by carbon dating. Uh, it would have had a, uh, a sail, uh, a mast in the middle of the boat to hold a simple sail. There's kind of a, a it, you can see the detail up there uh, on, on the screen in the back uh, behind the boat. They give you kind of a illustration of what it would have looked like. Uh, one mass, uh, a simple square sail that could be raised or lowered. Uh, and then it also had, I uh, say, like four spaces for four oars on each side of the boat. You didn't, oh, you didn't always count on the wind being in the right direction. So sometimes they would have to row the boat. There are all people in this boat. Uh, it was pretty full, <laughs> and the, the storm may not have had to been too violent for the waves to lap over the sides of the boat, because it was uh, it was heavy laden with uh, 12, 13 people in, inside that boat. Uh, and it, anyway, the, the exact size, shape of the boat isn't you know, all, all that uh, crucial to <laughs> what Jesus taught, uh, but it's just kind of a, something that's uh, of interest. There's something they found from the first century. Uh, let's see, now we'll go back and look at the text. Uh, screen text. There we go. So verse 19, <clears throat> when Jesus had gone a little far further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Uh, and the, the nets, uh, it's interesting, so Peter, Peter, or Simon, Peter, and Andrew were casting a net, one net. Uh, here, uh, James and John had nets, plural. And one commentator says that is because the kind of nets they lowered from a boat would have would be more than they have three layers. First, a coarse uh, a coarse layer to give it strength, and then a slightly smaller mesh, uh, and then last a very fine mesh uh, to catch to catch the uh, to prevent the fish from escaping in the intermediate mesh. So there would be three layers in the net. So they were always cast uh, together, and they would be nets plural. They might be 100 feet long, or but they could also be strung together end to end and have uh, you know 300, three of them end to end, and that way they could surround a bigger area and look towards the shore. And a little uh, 
and they, and they would have to do this at night. The big, biggest mesh of nets was uh, <clears throat> for strength. They didn't have nylon back then. Uh, so, so they had to use ropes, basically, and they were very visible to the fish. So that's why they had the fish at nighttime. Uh, and the, gospel, you know, the gospel stories talk about them. Oh, we have fished all night and haven't caught anything, uh, Peter said. That's why they were out at night. So it was, it was a lot of work uh, for them. They would stay up all night and then mend their nets in the daytime. Uh, so they, uh, it was, as many uh, occupations were, there was a lot of work involved. Anyway, so Jesus saw James and John inside the boat. They were preparing the nets. They might have been mending them. Uh, they might have just been getting ready for to to uh, you know holding them properly so that they will uh, lead out of the boat uh, correctly. Either way, they were they were basically working. Uh, so verse twenty. Immediately he called them, and they left their fathers of the in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So they went to where he was going. So and Mark doesn't say what exactly uh, they did that day, but you know, verse 21 then tells another story. They went to Capernaum. Uh, and I think I showed that last, last week, but I'll look at it again. Uh, a little map of the area. Where Capernaum is. There we go. It's on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. And this, actually, the Sea of Galilee was where three different political jurisdictions met. They all had some boundary on the Sea of Galilee. The uh, area of Galilee was, was ruled by Herod Antipas. The area east, east of the Jordan River, uh, where Bethsaida, uh, was that was the area of Perea ruled by Herod Philip, uh, another son of Herod the Great. And his headquarters was further north in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus traveled there a bit later in his ministry. It's just, you know, so, but it was common for people to be going back and forth from one political jurisdiction to the other. On the southeast side was the, the Decapolis, which was almost exclusively a Gentile area. Uh, Decapolis is the Greek word for 10 cities. Uh, they named it that, and then they built two more cities. <laughs> so there was actually 12 cities in the 10 cities. But a, a couple of names there, like Gergesa was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Hippos was on a hillside set back a little bit, but they would, each town would have a little bit of territory on the shoreline that they called their own. So they, you know, it's kind of a multinational uh, uh, sea, the Sea of Galilee, or sometimes called the Lake, of, as Luke did in Luke 5, uh, the Lake of Gennesaret. And that comes from the Hebrew word kinnereth, which means harp. And they apparently named after the shape of the lake. It reminded at least somebody of the shape of a harp. Uh, but the most common name in the Gospels is uh, Sea of Galilee. It's not, it's, some people prefer to call it a lake because it's fresh water. Uh, they like to reserve the word sea for salty water. But traditional names are, they're hard to, hard to change. The traditional name is the Sea of Galilee. It's a pretty big lake, it has waves and all that, but no tides. Okay, we'll go back to the text. So they went to Capernaum, on, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. And there, I've got another picture. Uh, of, not of the uh, synagogue. Well, uh oh, I lost my Zoom menu. Oh, there it is, because I hadn't stopped sharing it. Yeah, there. I'll share a different screen now. Uh, 
And here is an aerial picture of a synagogue in Capernaum. This is not, this probably dates from the fourth century, so it's not the one that Jesus was actually in. There is another, uh, there's a foundation underneath this one that is probably the same foundation as what Jesus would have used. But this gives a, a illustration of a little bit of the architecture of synagogues in, in that time period. Ah, yes, I was talking with Jerry. I don't know whether they had palm trees in Capernaum. Yeah, I see one right there in the picture. Uh, yeah, it's it's a, a warm weather tree. Sea of Galilee is below sea level. Uh, and so it stays, it's a little bit protected from uh, colder weather. Jerusalem being at a higher elevation uh, gets snow sometimes. And this is the area near that synagogue. It shows some of the foundations and lower walls of the houses in Capernaum. In the background is a museum uh, for, for the national park that you know, controls that uh, territory. Uh, so this is a, would be a big tourist spot. Uh, people to come to see the, the, the Capernaum synagogue. Even though it's not the same building as what Jesus was in, it's the same place as far as they know. Uh, Jerusalem has, or Israel has a lot of archaeological national parks. Archaeology goes back you know, 4,000 years, so they've got a lot to work with and a lot of uh, archaeological uh, money has gone into that. A, a dig can cost a million dollars. You know, it's a lot of, a lot involved in it. So they've got foundations that support it and the they have to prioritize because there are just so many places uh, to, that are possible, possibly worth digging up, but they can't dig, up, dig them all up. They just have to kind of reserve it and say, you know, people stay out of this. It's illegal to loot them, uh, but sometimes that happens anyway. So Jesus went into the synagogue and he began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So he was presenting himself as having some kind of authority. You know, you'd, you'd think that the teachers of the law would have some you know, authority. You know, they'd studied this. Uh, they were the people who were... Uh, knew how to read and write, and they had studied the scriptures for a long time, you would think that the people would ascribe to them some authority. What seems to be working here is that the Jewish custom at the time, as we can see in the later Jewish writings of the Talmud, uh, is that the rabbis rarely claimed anything for themselves. They would say, oh, as so-and-so taught uh, and they refer back to the past. They're building on tradition, and they don't, they're not presenting ideas as their own. Uh, it reminds me, I, I, I don't remember which author it was, but it's just some kind of commentator. He was saying, he's, he's writing in there, he says, I hope there is nothing original in this book. <laughs> he, he is relying on he wants to report what other people have said. And that's what the scribes in Jesus' day were doing too. They were, were reporting what others had said. Whereas Jesus simply came and said, this is the way it is. Uh, he wasn't citing any other authority. He was simply speaking on his own authority. Uh, and of course, as the author of scripture, <laughs> he would have... Uh, an unbeatable authority, even though he couldn't tell them, oh yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> but he could speak authoritatively to what these texts meant. 
And people were amazed at this, that he was speaking with uh, self-authority. Just then, verse 23, just then, uh, probably immediately, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit. Now, that's interesting that there was uh, a, an impure spirit in the synagogue, kind of an incongruity, uh, but that happens too. You, you can, we can get, uh, you know, demon-possessed, mentally troubled people coming to churches uh, and shouting out. Uh, that's, that happens. Uh, so here he is in a synagogue, and he shouts out, What do you want to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? And who is this us? Uh, well, the uh, initial understanding of the reader would be, well, he's, he's speaking on behalf of the townspeople. Uh, what do you want with, uh, you know, the, us in the, uh, in Capernaum, Jesus? Uh, but then he says, have you come to destroy us? Or are you here to bring our town to ruin? Uh, but then he says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So he's speaking not on behalf of the people of Capernaum, but he's speaking on behalf of the world of evil spirits. Uh, and he's, and this, when he says, what do you want to do with us, Jesus? Uh, he's using a, a, a phrase that's also found uh, in the Old Testament, basically meaning, uh, you know, this is none of your business. Uh, you know, don't be meddling in our affairs. Uh, it's, you know, stay, you know, stay, stay out of my life, mind your own business. But Jesus is minding his own business. He, he, is, he has come to bring holy, uh, holiness to wherever he goes. And there's this impure spirit, uh, evil spirit. He wants to bring holiness to the man who was possessed by this demon. So, uh, and then he says, I know you are the Holy One of God. Holy One, uh, pretty uh, high title. Uh, in fact, God himself is called the Holy One. It's possible that others could be called holy as well. So it's kind of an, you know, most titles can be taken in more than one way, uh, like Lord. Uh, Lord is also used for God, but it's also used for ordinary landowners. So most titles can be used different ways. And but Mark is, uses these in some uh, suggestively, saying, you know, he's, he's using this in more than an ordinary sense. And the, and the reason we can tell that is because Jesus is telling him to be quiet. Uh, and, I, and of course, the question is why? Well, why does Jesus tell the demon to be quiet? A uh, couple of reasons. Uh, he doesn't want that kind of publicity, <laughs> he, he, does, he doesn't give their testimony any credibility. He doesn't want people listening to demons. He wants them to find out for themselves who he is. And the other is, <clears throat> another reason is that is if Jesus gets unwanted publicity, he would get more and more people uh, and they would uh, pressure him into being uh, a kind of Messiah that he didn't want to be. One of the other gospel accounts, how they wanted to make him king. The, the crowds wanted to make him king, but he didn't want to be king, he, that kind of king. He didn't want to be their kind of king. He had his own kingdom in mind and his own version of being king. So he did not want the demons to be blabbing uh, these titles when they would be misunderstood. So verse 25, he says, be quiet. Uh, shut up. <laughs> shut up and go away. Uh, come out of him. Uh, and so the impure spirit shook the man violently. And as we see from other accounts of exorcisms uh, in the first century, this was kind of a standard indication 
that the demon was in fact leaving the person. Uh, so this is where, instance. Mike, this is where the Catholic religion got their exorcism from. Well, yeah, it could be. I don't know if they have certain uh, rituals to do. Yeah, but yeah this is, uh, they, they would, uh, I mean, if they're going to exor exercise demons, it reminded, it reminded me of quite an old movie now, The Exorcist, uh, but kind of a sacrilegious one as well. Uh, hmm. I never saw it. I have a question. Yes. Back in um, verse 24, when he says, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I guess I always interpreted that to be the demon saying, have you come to destroy us, the demons? Like in other times he said, don't, don't send me over here or, you know, let me go into the swine or don't, you know, lest I run off into the ditch. Yes. Yes. I, I always interpreted that to say, have you come to destroy us, meaning us, the demons, but that what he was talking about the people in the well, I, I, think, I think there are two meanings could be interpreted there just like the titles can be interpreted in more than way I think his statement there could be interpreted on a a secular level as well as a spiritual level and okay. I, I'm glad you brought that up because Mark does intend to uh, point to this destruction that Jesus did, in, in fact, come to destroy the devil, that he did come to destroy the demonic world. Uh, not that it is com completely powerless. Apostle Paul continues to tell us to, to have spiritual warfare, to be on our guard against uh, things. I just, uh, just a half hour ago, I was reading First Peter, and he says, you know, uh, be on your guard against... Uh, the devil, because he's seeking people to devour. Uh, yeah, the, the, the demonic world is, is there, and uh, so this, this is kind of a play on words, or a, it's kind of a, a sentence with two levels of meaning. Got it. Uh, Thank you. Question, Mike, follow up? Yes. I wonder how the uh, readers at the time of uh, Mark, uh, you know, when there's this mention in the Gospels, a lot of mention on demons. And looking back in the Old Testament, uh, there isn't much mention of demons. So I wonder how they understood uh, the idea mm -hmm. of demons when in the Old, there isn't much. Right. A lot of their Jewish beliefs about demons or the demonic world developed between the time of the two testaments. Uh, some attribute it to influence from Zoroastrians, from Persia, uh, but we can see in the Jewish writings of the you know, first, second century BC, a lot more interest in demons. They would give all sorts of names, uh, kind of naming a hierarchy of, of demons. Uh, I remember one was named Metatron. <laughs> to me, it sounds like a science fiction name. <laughs> but uh, Zazel was a, they said was a name of another demon. Of course, that relates to the, the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. But they had a, a bunch of other names that they, you know, and there's no reason to, for us to accept these names as accurate. But it does illustrate that the Jewish culture was more interested in demons at the time. So the, when people, when Jesus was dealing with these demons, the people of his day had concepts of evil spirits. It didn't come from the Old Testament, but came from this intertestamental theological developments. Uh, all right, verse 26. So the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. One interesting thing about uh, Jesus being an exorcist is that he simply told the demons to go away. 
Jewish exorcists tried to find magic words, potions, uh, magic uh, yeah, words to say, uh, or special chemicals to use in an effort to force the demon to leave. Uh, force some smelly stuff up the person's nose, uh, stuff that they thought that the demon would not like and so would leave because of the smell. Uh, <laughs> the cure was worse than the disease. Uh, but yeah, whereas Jesus told them to go away. Uh, he, he had his own authority, not just in teaching, but also in his exorcism. It's interesting here that Mark is telling us like the first thing Jesus does, even though Jesus is a teacher, the first thing Mark presents is this exorcism. He has power over the evil spiritual world. This is his kingdom invading the world of invading Satan's kingdom, kicking it out. Uh, and there's a parable later in the gospel about how the strong man, you know, he will bind, bind the demon and, uh, and take over. And this is what Jesus is doing. He is bringing the kingdom in. This is one of the ways in which he's doing it. He is exerting spiritual authority. So verse 27, the people were amazed. They asked each other, what is this? A new teaching. Oh, we don't know. The teaching, the only teaching he's mentioned so far is that the kingdom is about to arrive. And with authority, they say. He even gives orders to impure spirits. They obey him. And verse 28, news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Capernaum was a uh, market town. So People in outlying villages would come to the city to trade goods, to buy things that they needed, and news would spread that way. So their idea quickly may not be the same as, uh, you know, Facebook Messenger <laughs> may not, wouldn't be that fast, but still it's, uh, they, uh, it was uh, the talk of the town, as they might say. Verse 29, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon and Andrew were brothers living together. And verse 30, Simon's mother-in-law apparently lived there as well, in bed with a fever. And they immediately told Jesus about her. So there was this, a small housing compound. I do think I have a picture of... Uh, one of their houses or a reconstruction. Uh, no, it's not there. There's the Jesus boat. There's okay. There's a kind of a rough sketch artist rendering of what a first century house might look like. Uh, would have the rooftop would be flat where they could, and in, uh, in this illustration, they've got a few baskets of you know, maybe grain or something up there. This would be a, a work area, a work area that the uh, animals could be kept out of. Animals, as you can see, a, a goat there. Goats can climb stairs. But I see they have a fence at the top of the stairs to kind of keep the goats out. Uh, anyway, so the, and the goats would freely kind of roam. Sometimes they would roam inside the house too. Uh, but they have steps up to the top of the, uh, the roof. The house itself would be quite small. A uh, room, basically, room for a, a kitchen and a sleeping area. Sometimes there would be more than one house uh, connected to each other. 
that's probably what uh, Simon, Andrew, and Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, that's probably how how they had arranged it, all within a this walled compound. Uh, you can see a wall there. And I had another one as well, but there, this is kind of the inside of the open area. It's, this is still, this would be considered inside the house. Uh, but it's pretty rustic, uh, pretty rough looking. I, they've got some, a few uh, well chiseled stones on the doorway, uh, but most of the others are pretty, you know, just field stones, not, not uh, dressed or squared off. <coughs> Fit them together as they best they could with some, some mortar. Uh, not all houses had mortar. If they just pick the right shapes of stones, they could stack them up pretty well. Uh, this reconstruction has mortar. So there would be, a, a, I guess, a platform up there, like kind of a second floor, not, it's not the roof. They'd have a roof above that, uh, even higher than that. And then they'd have a small sleeping area under, underneath. The roofs were flat, and we'll re read about that uh, in chapter two, is when they broke through the roof. Uh, because they were, they were flat, partly because that was a part of their work area. So Peter, Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. So immediately, <laughs> Jesus goes into them. Uh, Immediately, they told Jesus about her. They didn't, Mark doesn't tell us that they asked Jesus to heal her. Uh, that's probably implied there. Uh, they told Jesus, uh, we're telling you this because you can do something about it. So verse 31, so Jesus went to her, took her hand. He touched a woman who was not in his own family. That was uh, not a correct thing to do in Jewish society, uh, but this is the way, this is what he did to heal her. Took her hand, helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Uh, and this was apparently on a Sabbath day. Uh, she was waiting on them. Uh, so Jesus is not following all the Jewish rules, but he is showing that he has an authority that is greater than what their rules were. Uh, verse 32, that evening after sunset, after Sabbath was done, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. And apparently, Capernaum had quite a few demon-possessed people in the town. Verse 33, the whole town gathered at the door. Jesus healed many who had various diseases. Uh, that doesn't mean that he chose not to heal some. Uh, it just means that there were many who had various diseases. Uh, there were, and so Jesus healed, uh, there were many healings, but there are also different kinds of diseases that he was healing. Uh, Mark does not give us the details on those. He's fo he's focuses here more on the demons. He also drove out many demons. He's kind of emphasizing that by repetition. And he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. He didn't want their kind of publicity. Verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got left the house, went off to a solitary place, as best you could, uh, he could find one, I guess. Uh, it's, not, it's not a desert. There are people living around, but he could find a place in a grove of trees or somewhere where he was out of, uh, out of view and where he prayed. Mark tells us that he prayed three times. Luke has, gives a few more incidences of when he prayed, but Mark is still saying that this is 
something that Jesus uh, Jesus did. He, he didn't actually say, Mark doesn't tell us why Jesus prayed, but it's at different points in his ministry. And like he is after this big day of uh, healing, of healing diseases, you know, casting out demons. I don't know, did he need to be re-energized? Did he need to be refocused in what he was doing? Uh, you know, asking the father where he wanted to minister. I think all of those are options. Uh, Verse 36, Simon Peter and his companions went to look for him. Uh, they might have known where he went, where he probably went. Uh, when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus, you are famous. <laughs> you are in demand. People want you. Uh, whether these were, uh, and, and this would have been later in the morning too. The people would have been, would have arrived at Jesus uh, at the house uh, you know, shortly after sunrise, and then it would have taken them, uh, you know, maybe they had even more uh, sicknesses or demon-possessed people that needed Jesus' attention. Or they simply were gathering for, uh, to see the show. Uh, wow, look, look at this. Uh, but Jesus replied in verse, let's go somewhere else. That's okay. Lots of people want me in Capernaum. But I want to go somewhere else. And that is initially surprising. Uh, he, he, you know, he was refusing ministry opportunity. We'd think some kind of ministry might be going on there. The people wanted him to do something. And he basically said, well, no, I, I, I've got other things to do. Uh, other people to help. Uh, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. You know, and, and apparently Luke, Mark has already told us that they have heard of Jesus. So he can go there and uh, the people are willing, willing to listen to what he is saying. He wants to preach uh, the kingdom of God as well as to heal their sick. Uh, the people in Capernaum have heard his message. They have seen his authority. Uh, they, it's like Jesus has achieved what he wanted to do in Capernaum. So he wants to go to other villages too. He says, that is why I have come to preach throughout Galilee. Verse 39, so he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And here Mark does not tell us healing as well, but that's probably understood that he would continue to do that. But Mark is stressing uh, they, this casting out demons as well as teaching. Any questions? I have a question. Uh... Verse uh, 34, when does there's so much, uh, you, you get this impression there's so much demon problems in this place, you know, every, every few verses. And the question I have in verse 34 is the statement, he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. So I was thinking about, okay, they were not able to speak because Christ has power, controls them, or they obeyed him because of his authority. I was just thinking because, because they knew who he was, or so maybe they would not speak because they recognized him. My question is why? I mean, aren't they evil, bad rebels, you know? They went against God and now suddenly they would obey Christ. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out this demons. Uh, what will Christ do to them if they spoke? You know what? Yeah, yeah. I, that's it's a good question. What would he do? It's a, apparently recognized that he had authority over them, whether to force them to be silent or to force them to leave. Uh, either way, and that Jesus uh, had um, 
and to use the language of Star Wars, the force. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus had power over them in some way. And as, as you note, they, they are, uh, I mean, they're disobedient spirits. So why is it then that Jesus can force them to obey when he is there in person? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, they seem to be afraid. You know, they they're afraid of torment or something in their minds. I mean, they're yeah. right. Have you come to destroy us? And mm -hmm. later, the, the the demons were uh, the the legion, where they were cast into pigs. You know, they were they were afraid that Jesus had come to uh, defeat them before the time. You know, before the time allotted, they they knew their days were numbered. Uh, yeah, they were they were somehow afraid, and not uh, not so afraid that they became obedient. They were still disobedient, the evil spirits. Mm -hmm. Kind of a, the mystery of evil. Yeah. You know, Satan knows who God is. He knows that, uh, but. That, you know, that, that his knowledge does not change his to who God is. Uh, and I, I guess played around with that a little bit in his, uh, in his book about the screw tape letters, the, uh, the, what a, a high ranking demon might write to a lower ranking demon and how to describe their view of God's goodness, which they don't like. Uh, you know, they, they've got the word good and good in there, but, you know, oh, yeah, they, they recoil from it. And, and it's, it, it, but it's, it's still a mystery uh, why people would reject the good things that God is uh, and say, no, no, I, I don't want a part of that. I think I have a better life. It just, it's like, it makes no sense. Uh, but we see it. Uh, we, we see how it has happened uh, in, in the demons. When we see it, sometimes it seems in uh, some people who just seem to set themselves to go the wrong way, uh, seemingly knowing what they're giving up. We do not understand that. Evil is a, a mystery. Uh, the thing that we do know for sure about evil is that it will be eliminated. God has told us that. That's why he's waiting. Uh, well, that's another area for speculation, too. Why didn't Jesus kick out all the demons in Galilee uh, from his home base in Capernaum? Why did he have to go to that person? We don't know. <laughs> Parts of the world we don't understand. All right, we've got a few more minutes there. We can continue with verse 40. A man with leprosy, some sort of skin disease. It, it's not what people call leprosy today. Or the official name is Hansen's disease. Uh, but it was some sort of skin condition that was apparently contagious. Uh, and it's one of the few diseases in the Old Testament that are quarantined, that are described. Uh, and so they were, there was a, a tremendous stigma against people with leprosy. They were ostracized from society. They had to live outside of the towns. Uh, they had to uh, cover their heads and shout out unclean so that people wouldn't accidentally touch them. And so they kind of eked out a meager existence in kind of their own colonies. They heard this man with leprosy came to him. And bold, that's pretty bold in itself. And begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The man was, had faith that Jesus was able to do this. He didn't necessarily know that Jesus would, uh, but uh, 
you know, that's, uh, he, he hadn't seen, he hadn't read the Gospels yet because they hadn't been written yet. <laughs> now, now we know that, yeah, Jesus is willing to do that. Uh, so the man said, well, you know, please, uh, I, I know you can do this. Uh, can you please do it for me? 31 different translations of the Bible have this different. Uh, one, some ancient Greek versions say Jesus was indignant, uh, kind of angry. Other old Greek texts say he was filled with compassion. So, so the, the experts who pour over all these details uh, discuss well, which of these is the more likely the original reading? And some say, well, uh, we can understand why a scribe would change it from being angry to being filled with compassion, because there's other gospels, uh, other gospel, other verses tell us that he had compassion. So they can understand that kind of change. But why would a scribe change it from compassion to being indignant, uh, to being upset. Uh, was, well, was, you know, they couldn't think of any reason for why a scribe would do that. So they said, well, and that's, and that's probably the, what was really the original. But others say, well, you know, all these manuscripts that say compassion are good manuscripts. They are old, they are have good readings in other places. They, uh, so there's, there's a debate about which is correct. And either way, either way can work. Uh, if, if Jesus was indignant, we have to ask, what was he indignant about? Is he upset that the man uh, asked for cleansing? Is he upset that the man didn't know whether he would be willing? Uh, or more likely that Jesus is upset with disease uh, and the social ostracism that, uh, that went along with it. This, this kind of disease uh, was so disruptive to this person's uh, role in society, what it meant to be a human. Ask your question, Mike? Yeah. If maybe because he was indignant because as we read on, we find out that he had asked him to do something and the man didn't do what he asked him to do. Uh, well, that he could be foreseeing that. That's what I'm after. So it's preordained that maybe he knew this and that's why he was indignant. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's an interesting. He, he could, he would, and, and Mark does later, does tell us that Jesus knew what they were thinking. So, yeah, that's, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. he, he knew what this guy was thinking, and he says, well, look, man, you put me on the spot. You know, here, I, I know you're not going to keep quiet about this, even though I tell you to, but I do want to heal your leprosy. So which am I going to do? Uh, yeah, that, that could be kind of upsetting as well. <laughs> what, is the, what is the Greek? word that is used for that is translated compassion in this text wasn't this or an original greek word i mean they're to me indignant and compassion are not close in me no. <laughs> and i want to choose to believe it was compassion but i i do see that he could be indignant knowing foreseeing what's happening going to happen but what was the greek because you talked about different translations that were good old texts used one and and some used the other but what does the Greek? What is the Greek translation? Of the Greek well, that's, that's the problem. There are two different Greek translations. Some texts have this Greek word. Some texts have that oh, word. one. Both from the Greek text has the word for uh, anger. It's the, the related to the Greek word that's used for wrath. Okay. And it's you know it it amuses me that uh, that the translators don't want to say that Jesus had wrath. <laughs> That's too strong a word. So they say, uh, one says incensed. Uh, and the other, the other, the Greek word is related to the word for bowels. Uh, he was, his, 
is uh, he was moved in the bowels. Is he was a uh, like there's a English so, but so clearly he was moved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was moved, whether it be with compassion or whether it be with something else. He was yeah, that, moved. Yeah, that's right. And it's quite it's possible that he, he was both. He was upset at the disease and he was compassionate for the man. Mike, the, the Aramaic is, uh, it clearly states moved with compassion. And then it goes on to say that there, there are two aromatic words for anger and, and compassion are written almost identically. Oh, in Aramaic, they're very similar. Oh. Uh, so the, the, uh, the difference could have originated even before the trans Greek translations were made. Ah. But, yeah, well, thanks. Thank you. Well, that's, we've come to the end of our allotted hour. Uh, any other comments? <laughs> Oh, uh, I'd like to make a comment, my guys. It's uh, to me, it's interesting to see that Jesus has a uh, complete control over demons, but over one man with free will, who is probably an old man with leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 one, but uh, yeah, he just you know he doesn't control. So you can see where the power of God is for. Demons, he has control of them, but uh, human free will, you know, he, he lets it go. Yeah, that's a, a good, interesting point. Yeah, this is so very yeah. <laughs> All over the physical and the supernatural world, non physical world. Hmm. All right. The important thing, though, is that Jesus does have power. <laughs> yes. that's when and remember is, uh, that. His perspective is fully God and fully human. Yes. Right. Yeah. And perspective. His perspective is what that we have to remember that as well. We personalize it from the human level because that's where we are. But he has a global picture of what God is doing, what it all means. Yeah, that's right. We're, we have to trust him on that. Exactly. Even when two and two doesn't add up to four is what he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> says, well, okay, if that's the way it is, we'll take it in the way you tell us. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank, thank you. you so much, Mike. Have a good week. Very See you good. Sunday. See you Sunday. Yeah, we uh, yeah we will have a uh, a Zoom fellowship fifteen minutes before uh, worship services on Sunday. So you're welcome to tune in to Zoom. Uh, I, I think we'll have a little different address, but Jillian will be sending out the link for that uh, on Saturday and Sunday. So, might see you then. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.